Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Terry Beckman, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from North Carolina. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about reconciling the CEO's capacity dilemma. I'm super excited about unpacking that with you and exploring what this means, both in a traditional corporate setting, but also within the nonprofit sector. And as we get started, I wanted to share Terry's bio with everybody. Terry Beckman and her experienced team at Heigl help mission-driven leaders increase revenue and community impact by an average of 50% within 12 months of working together. Terry has worked in business and organizational development for over 30 years, including five years as an executive director. She understands leadership challenges and has been a strategic advisor and consultant to executive directors and CEOs throughout the United States as they grew their organizations, teams, and boards of directors. And that's just a snapshot of of Terry and, and all the cool things you do, Terry. But anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in further? Well, I would say I, the other thing that um, is a thread through uh, a lot of my work is um, my background in Buddhist psychology. Um, and that uh, frames a lot of, of the work that we do. Um, I, I've found over the years that... Um, Eastern philosophy and, and in particular Buddhism has um, an incredible understanding of, of the mind. And we in the West are kind of catching up to that now, mm -hmm. which is very cool. Um, and it's just really cool too, to see how like the latest in neuroscience aligns exactly with, you know, teachings that are 2000 years old. Um, so yeah, I, go I figure, would just right? say, yeah, go figure. <laughs> anyway, just to share that kind of, tidbit as well. Um, but thank you for the kind introduction. John. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you framing it with with your your Buddhist influences and background. And um, while I'm not Buddhist, uh, I've been heavily influenced by Buddhist philosophies as well. I've, I've spent ex an extended period of time uh, in many uh, Asian countries and uh, oh, kind nice. of consider myself, you know, what while not a practicing Buddhist, uh, certainly a kind of a novice, um, you know, uh, uh, I, someone who dabbles in, in Buddhist uh, philosophy. And, and I think, like you say, it brings a lot of, uh, of really great insights into how we're trying to deal with the complexities of, of the world around us today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, let's start by talking about this CEO capacity dilemma. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Um, you know, what we've seen in the, the market um, in the last few years, I think that's certainly coming out of COVID, is um, this interesting phenomenon where um, many leaders are having trouble hiring, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the phenomenon of um, quiet quitting that kind of contributes to um, folks not being able to run companies as productively as they would like, mm -hmm. but also having open positions that are, you know, difficult to fill and turnover rates that um, people have been very unhappy with. Um, it seems to be stabilizing some, I think, with, with incomes, with, you know, basically salaries um, um, increasing in the last year or so. Uh, we're, we're seeing a little bit less, less vacancies, which is really great. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know in, in certain in certain areas, especially with frontline workers, it's still really, really a challenge to fill those positions in certain industries. Um, and the turnover rate still continues to be higher than folks would like. And so we have that going on, right, which you would call probably under capacity, folks mm -hmm. operating at under capacity. And then you have the 
you know, the workforce that is there and engaged and many of them feeling like they're really at overcapacity, right? And they're clearly they're linked. Um, and we see that in data where people are, are talking about, you know, very high percentages of folks that quit are, are referencing burnout um, mm-hmm. and just looking for, you know, looking for something else, looking for more work-life balance. So it's this sort of interesting contradiction of living with both overcapacity and undercapacity at the same time within organizations. Yeah, the 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 over under element um, <laughs> and the burnout piece. I think it's really important to highlight uh, really the challenges that we're facing within organizations. And and oftentimes we do talk about the burnout um, that general kind of line level people are experiencing, even middle managers, uh, et cetera. And sometimes we don't talk about the overall impact that's having on executive leadership roles, um, because just as I can experience burnout in my day to day, so can they. And and hopefully, you know, hopefully I have leader, you know, a team lead who is has emotional intelligence and empathy and they can see me for where I'm at and try to be supportive of me. But do they always have that person that they report to um, that also mm-hmm. provides that kind of support? And I think often not. And so there, there's this heavy burden um, from a, a burnout perspective that's placed on leaders. Um, you know, I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and, and assume that people have the best of intentions. Um, and yet a lot of times leaders who I think have good intentions simply don't have the capacity to to do what's expected in this new age of leadership. Um, you know, maybe they don't have the, the bandwidth, certainly, but also the skill sets needed uh, that are different today uh, to be an effective leader versus, you know, maybe how someone could have been successful 20 years ago. So, you know, I think all of this kind of feeds yeah. into what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, you know, I, I think organizations are just infinitely more complex in, in this new age. Um, and we, we talk often about the, you know, kind of the, the pyramid where, you know, the CEO is at the top and has the vision and kind of is able to just tell people what to do if they want to keep their jobs and do it, right? Um, it just doesn't work very well anymore um, in, a, in, a, I think, in a culture where we're highly interconnected, intergenerational lots of ways to make money on the side, right? Mm-hmm. Or even full-time, um, these people have so many more options. You know, that model is um, from kind of the industrial age. It's just not meant really for today's workforce. But, you know, then it leaves the, uh, open this question of how, how do we develop like truly collaborative leadership models where people's voices can be heard in a way that's productive and, you know, unleashes the best in everyone. And it's, um, yeah, it requires an entirely different set of skills for sure. You, you, you've touched on this already, but what, what do you see this, this contradiction costing this undercapacity, uh, operating under capacity and employees operating over capacity? What is this really costing businesses in practical terms? Both, I, I suppose, both from the business uh, perspective, kind of the bottom line, but also the human perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan. Um, I would say it's very expensive, honestly. Um, you know, we um, we work a lot with mission-driven organizations. And for example, um, we've had clients where they simply couldn't hire enough early childhood development teachers, right? And so whole classrooms then, I mean, there's a teacher-student ratio. If you can't hire the teachers, there's not enough adults in, in the room, you know, you can't have the classroom essentially. So like things just, um, and that's a huge revenue loss for the organization, right? Like they actually have the funding to be able to have multiple classrooms and they literally can't do it because they don't have the, they don't have the workers in place. So I mean, for, for organizations like that, it's a, it's a real bottom line thing. There's a real loss of productivity and revenue that happens because of that. Um, and I think then on the human side, you know, just the, um, the, the cost of burnout is really high. Um, and it's, you know, stress is 
we know is, is very connected to both our mental and physical health. Um, and so this can be seen, um, you know, this can be seen in all kinds of ways, right? Through um, higher, you know, higher use of, of medical facilities and insurance rates. I mean, if you want to like, again, get right back down to the bottom line, but on a, on a human level, right? We don't want our team members sick. We don't want our team members burning out and stressed, not being able to sleep at night, being preoccupied, being distracted at work, all of that has a, an effect on, on productivity and it also spreads, right? It's, you know, yeah. if, I mean, if somebody's unhappy at work, it affects their teammates for sure, right? It's a drag. It's literally a drag on the organization. And, you know, it's also just a, it's an, in a way a loss of a human life, at least in those moments, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a tragedy unto itself that um, I think is, it, it really is unnecessary, um, it, it, it's possible to, to organize our, ourselves, I think, in a different way. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think I, I agree that the both the business cost, you know, like the bottom line cost is high, the human cost is high. Um, and so we do need to organize, organize ourselves in a different way. What, what do you see that looking like? Um, you know, because like you said, you know, certainly loss of productivity from burnout, uh, absenteeism uh, goes up from burnout, um, quality usually goes down from burnout, etc. Like we could list so many different things um, that are, are direct byproducts uh, that come from burnout um, that negatively impact the organization, uh, certainly impact the people within the organization. Um you know, as I've experienced burnout at various times in my career, I also just note, you know, I'm someone I, you know, not to toot my own horn too much, but I think I'm a highly productive person. Uh, I think I collaborate well. I think I, I have an innovative entrepreneurial mindset. Like, I think there's a lot I bring to the table. And yeah. once I hit that burnout stage, um, guess what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm dialing down big time <laughs> because, because what's the point anymore? Like I'm, I'm kind of fed up. I'm, I'm frustrated. Uh, I don't see, I don't see any, any reason to continue pushing to the level that I had pushed previously. And yeah. that's, that can be a loss to me, but it's a particularly a loss to the organization and it's a loss to the other people that I work with. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so what do you see as some of those things that organizations can do to reorganize around this idea of, yeah. of addressing this capacity dilemma uh, yeah. so that we help to reduce burnout. So we keep people activated, engaged, and and happy in the work that they're doing where they feel fulfilled and they can contribute in meaningful ways in a sustainable way. Yeah, it, that's a huge question, right? Um, and I, I wish it had a simple answer. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, and I just could be flippant and try to give you a simple answer, but you know, it's not really... It's not really a good use of your listeners' time, I don't think. Um, and I, I, so I, I think I'm maybe just to give you give a, folks a few ideas on a couple of different levels, right? Um, one is if we're talking about it, kind of the you know the organizational level, right? In terms of how we're organized and how we're working, so earlier we referenced like the, the pyramid, right? Where, you know, sort of this top down structure. And um, what we found working with our clients is that they don't necessarily need to change their organizational structure. Although if we're doing kind of strategic visioning work with them, right? And they need to pivot and move in a new direction, then oftentimes we do need to look at the org chart, right? But, you know, to address this issue per se, that isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a fan of a flat org chart because that mm. creates its own problems as well. Mm -hmm. But I think in a, in a collaborative leadership model, what happens is that the role of the senior team starts to change. So it's not so much telling people what to do, which has been a lot of how we have operated for a long time, but it becomes... Um, much more one where, and this does, this does assume that the organization really does have a shared vision for the future and that the team understands where the organization is going 
and they understand their role in it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that very much is the job of the CEO and the leadership team is to create that awareness and to, to go to the trouble of, you know, of setting that, right? So it's clear for folks, this is where we're going. This is why having people ideally contribute that's, you know, to that shared vision as well, so that it truly is shared. And often if it's done well, that the vision strengthens with other people's participation in it. Um, but once that's established, then the goal of the senior team becomes, you don't have to tell people what to do because they actually right. know what their role is, but they become, then that senior team becomes the, the resource providers, right? Mm -hmm. Giving people the resources to be able to reach their goals. Um, the obstacle removers, right? Because right. We're, we're yeah. going from A to B, there's gonna be obstacles. And sometimes mm -hmm. the individual or a specific team the obstacle may be such systemic in a way that they can't remove it by themselves, right? So that's another role. And then really, I think um, engaging in, a, in a, a coaching model of feedback, right? Versus kind of, let's have our, you know, once a year evaluation and, you know, that everybody dreads on all sides. And, you know, right. you hear all the bad news, right? Of all the things you've done wrong and whether or not you're going to get your raise, like that's also extremely antiquated. Um, you know, so we want to be able to be getting regular feedback and know that knowing, you know, how am I doing? How's my team doing? How's the organization doing? And like moving forward on our objectives and where we get stuck. And if we have personal challenges, which everyone does, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you're getting the kind of support and encouragement and accountability is what it creates, but it's really, you know, it's support and encouragement to move through those challenges. Um, and it, what, what I've seen is um, it takes about a year to shift company culture to move in that direction, right? Once you, you've decided you want to do this and you start to change the kind of the meeting structure and the way you're communicating with folks and your role it takes about a year for everybody to get on board. So this is not something that happens like just because you say it's going to happen. Um, I think, so that's kind of one level that um, decreases burnout, honestly, because people feel much less isolated and they understand like how their role is connected to others. And you, you really start to feel like you're moving there as a team and an organization versus, you know, I'm stuck in this kind of silo department and we're just fighting for what, you know, we're going to do and I'm going to do as little as possible because I don't really know how my work is, affects anything else. And I want to get home and see my kids at night. You know, it just creates a different kind of participation and mindset, if that makes sense. You know, I think I think the other thing for that, that leaders can look at on you know in, in sort of particular sectors, right? Like if you're having a lot of turnover, say, you know, in hiring direct service workers, for example, um, mm -hmm. you know, understanding I think what what folks what's really important to them in terms of the work, right? Um, and especially for frontline staff, like what what is really important to them and then sharing what's important this goes back to kind of the vision and the values sharing with them what's important to the organization and what their role is in in meeting kind of the the, the vision and the goals of the organization and then seeing like where is their where is the vent right where can we meet that both are really accomplished and um what we what we've seen um, in helping organizations be able to reduce turnover and burnout in that way is often there are folks want growth opportunities that are not being provided and that the employer doesn't even understand that, you know, what, what growth opportunities truly are important to those employees um, and making the effort to actually, you know, provide those opportunities. Um, for folks. So again, there's like a sense of belonging, a sense of being heard, um, a sense that there's like a future for me here. And I'm not just a cog in the wheel, you know, turning. Um, 
you know, we love to look at really, I know you do a lot of work with, with human capital and, and really looking at the full life cycle of an employee in an organization. What does that look like from, you know, the time you're recruiting all the way through when they're leaving, right? Um, and how, how can you be strategic in really aligning individuals' needs with the, the organization's needs so that it's a good experience for everyone? Yeah, yeah, very well said. You, there are so many gems to what you just explained. Bottom line here is that we absolutely need to make sure that we're always focusing on not only the sustainability of our organization, that's important. If we don't have funding streams, we don't have revenue, we we won't continue to exist and we won't continue to operate. So we need to pay attention to the business case and the bottom line. Um, But sometimes we allow ourselves to get distracted from the humanity uh, involved with what we're trying to accomplish and the people involved. And the human case is just as powerful, just as strong. And, and I think you, you, you've done a good job of, of connecting the two um, and, and how that impacts organizations and how it impacts purpose-driven leaders, um, leaders that want to, to do meaningful things and help their teams to do meaningful things as well. Terry, I know we could continue on with this conversation for quite a long time, but I also know at the time, and I need to let you go here in a few minutes, before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. But, <clears throat> yeah, people can find us at um, highgold.co, H-I-G-O-L dot C-O. Um, and we have, we have, we host monthly roundtables for um, CEOs of mission-driven organizations, um, larger organizations with at least revenues over five million um, annually uh, on critical topics such as this um, throughout the year. So um, they're complimentary and it's just a wonderful way to meet leaders from across the country um, and walk away with you know some new insights and feel refreshed after you know an hour and a half or so together. Um, so you can go to our website and learn more about that. Um, you know, sign up to get an invitation to one of those. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn, so you you can find me there. Um, those are probably the best ways to connect with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Terry and our team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.